Grace and peace to each of you, to all of us together, as we begin this Advent journey again. I give thanks for the invitation of Dr. Smith to come, and I loved his invitation of uh, being free to choose a text, and you use that word again, free to read the scripture. That is a beautiful invitation and a beautiful possibility. Last week, as I began to think more intently about my time with you, however, I went to the lectionary to see what the appointed text would be for Sunday next. And as generally happens when I go there, I find my soul beckoned toward a text, and I'm refreshed in a sense that God is calling us forward into a particular word for a particular time. The text, one of them for this next Sunday, appointed by our church, is the Song of Zechariah. And when I saw that, I thought, yes, Zechariah, one of the great characters of Advent, one who waited in muteness, let all mortal flesh keep silence before the Lord. Hear this word from Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and all the revelations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both of them were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as priest before God... And his section was on duty. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and to offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people were praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw it, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I'm an old man and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to you to speak and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering, At his delay in the sanctuary, when he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. And when the time of service was ended, he went to his home. And in those days, Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion, and she said, This is what the Lord has done for me. When the Lord looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. And then over to verse 59. 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, No, he will be called John. They said to her, None of your relatives have this name. Then they began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. He asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. 
And all of them were amazed, and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue freed, and he began to speak, praising God. Fear came over all their neighbors, and all the things were talked about throughout the whole hill country of Judea. And all who heard them pondered and said, What will this child become? For indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on the people and redeemed them. God has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David. And he has spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered the holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Ten Christmases ago now, our daughter Brooke, who's now 24, was 14. Through an unfolding of circumstances in our family, she was packing up to go to Australia for six months. It had seemed like such a good idea. It had seemed like such a good idea. When my brother, who was going on sabbatical, said at a family gathering a year before, you know, there's an extra bedroom in the house in Canberra. Any of the cousins want to go? Our daughter had always thought kangaroos were great from the time she was a little tiny tot. Her hand was the first up, the only one up. She was serious, and so were they. And so the year unfolded, the plan was laid. Her teachers at school uh, arranged so that she could actually do her work by email, back and forth, as assignments were sent over to Australia. It was going to be a great adventure. But I confess to you, as a mother of a 14-year-old, even though she was departing with my brother, sister-in-law, two nephews, even though she was going to be there in the midst of loving family, I became extremely anxious. What if she gets sick halfway around the world? What if she gets homesick halfway around the world? She will need her mother. And as we drew near to the departure, the Christmas departure on the 23rd of December, We thought, let's gather all the family for a pre-Christmas party, and they all came to our house. We have a large family, and they came in with sleeping bags, and as you would, being a good host, we gave away the beds. And my husband Mike and I and our son Jason and Brooke took the loft above our family room and laid out four sleeping bags to await the coming of dawn and the journey to the airport to send Brooke on her way. I lay down on that sleeping bag, and I could just feel the anxiety flowing all over me. My heart was full. Tears were about to flow. Somehow, I was finally able to go to sleep. I awoke, lying on that sleeping bag on my back, looking up at the ceiling, which was just above us. We were in the loft. And as I opened my eyes, there on the ceiling... Above me was a perfect angel. And as I saw that lit, angelic form, I heard in a voice a little louder than a thought, but softer than a whisper, Fear not. Stunned, I reached over and, and touched Mike on the shoulder and pointed up. He saw it too because he whispered, Fear not. I reached on the other side and awoke Brooke and said, Brooke, look. She looked up and rubbed sleep from her eyes and said, Mom, what is it? I said, look, don't you see it? And she stared at the ceiling and, what is it, she said. 
She got up and stumbled in to the bathroom to get her shower to get ready to go. And Mike and I lay there looking at this incredible angel that would not go away. Now, I have to confess that we began to analyze that angel. And we could see that through the window into the loft, where the Christmas wreath was hanging with a large bow, the light was throwing what appeared to us in that moment to be a perfect angel. And we had heard this voice a little softer than a whisper, a little louder than a thought. And it was tempting to say, oh well, it was something we ate. It was the light through the window. But to this day, ten years later in our family, he and I still talk about the fear not angel that came, that comes. Our daughter, in her excitement to depart and head off to the airport, never could see the angel. But I'm confident that she will see the fear not angel when she needs it. (laughs) That God will appear to her in some mysterious way. In a wonderful way, at some point in time, when she, like her mother ten years ago this Christmas, was tied in knots with anxiety and fear about her child leaving for six months to celebrate her 15th anniversary halfway around the world. Now, I share that story with you because I love all the places in the Scripture where the angels appear and say, Fear not. And this story of Zachariah is one of the greatest, isn't it? As Zachariah is ministering, doing his his usual sort of ministry, a very extraordinary thing happens. The angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah. And Zechariah, the scripture says, is terrified. He is frightened. He is very afraid. But the angel says what the angel consistently says in scripture, Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. I bring you good news. And indeed it is good news for Zechariah and Elizabeth, who are advanced in age, who have thought this possibility of, of having a child has passed them by. And mysteriously, in a way that's impossible to ever explain the divine causalities, the angel Gabriel says, Zechariah, because of your inability to accept this news, you will be mute. Now, I love the fear not message of the angel, and I also love the muteness of Zechariah. Because the muteness of Zechariah is the posture of Advent, isn't it? Let all mortal flesh keep silence before the greatness of God, before the fresh coming of God, before Christ's appearance. An unfolding that is so immense and so powerful and so mysterious and so grand and so great that we stand mute before it because any attempt that we have to explain it and to explicate it and to make it all clear and reasonable fail. There is no reasonable explanation. There is no articulate description of this that can begin to match the way music or art or poetry can lift us to a spiritual appreciation for this great season. We are always called to be Advent people, even in late December and into January, February, March, April, into the new year. Because Advent people are waiting people. Advent people are mute people. Advent people are expectant people. Advent people are humble people. Humbled by necessity, as Zechariah was, or humbled by holy choice to stand before the goodness of God and to await God's fresh gift. To know that our efforts that we expend for God out there in the world are feeble efforts, never perfect, never complete, but honored and received by God in this holy season and always. And over and over and over again as we live this text, as we live in holy muteness before God, God will surprise us and lift us up and make us fresh and new and teach us what it is we need to learn In the world. One of the great opportunities for theological education in our time to prepare servants of God to live with Zechariah like muteness in the world, to be excellent listeners, to be able to engage with people and to hear their stories, 
to listen with people and to ask questions that open up the stories of our spiritual journeys. To be mewed out in the world and to watch the way God is at work. The temptation for theological education is for us to prepare one another to go out to explain it all. To be ready to argue people mentally into the realm of God and toward the foot of the cross. The greatest tool of evangelism for us is this Zachariah-like posture in the world. This faithful muteness as we embody Christ's life in the world Christ came to save. Sunday, I was at East Lawn Church in Pascagoula. East Lawn Church was engulfed by the rising water of Hurricane Katrina. Some of the leaders of that congregation shared with me that Katrina was actually the third storm that had driven them to the church. The other two were not as devastating, but the church being a bit higher than their homes seemed a safe place. And they came as Hurricane Katrina was advancing to the church. Soon there were 63 people gathered in the upper level of, of East Lawn Church. And they watched as the water came up and as the water went back down. We were there to dedicate the rebuild of their sanctuary and to rededicate it to God, beautifully rebuilt after the storm. But one of those leaders said to me, you know, it was an amazing thing that before Hurricane Katrina, we had a committee at work because this building in which we stand, the, the fellowship part of the building, was really pretty new. And the church was preparing guidelines for its use. And he grinned and he said, we were spending all these hours in meetings trying to articulate who could use it and when they could use it and how they could use it. And our committee had not finished our work. And here came Hurricane Katrina with the water rising. And suddenly we didn't need the committee at all. We disbanded it. Because Hurricane Katrina taught us how to use the building. Everyone can come anytime they need to come for whatever they need to come. And he laughed as he said it. You know, that wise leader of the church so beautifully was articulating a Zachariah-like posture in the world. A muteness, a humility to cast aside that committee that really wasn't needed anyway. And to live as God invites us to live. To use this building whenever it's needed, by whoever needs it, in whatever way that it's needed. In Advent, God's great invitation to us is to watch in this world for the inbreaking presence and power of God. And for those of us in this room that are preparing to give exams and to take exams, to receive this great gift of theological education and of dialogue and of learning, to better prepare our souls to be watchful, to keep silence before the Lord. In our first parish, Mike and I and our children, who were very young at the time, found as our next-door neighbors uh, members of our congregation. They came and introduced themselves on the day that we moved in. They invited us to come see their son and brother, who was not able to come help move boxes and to welcome us in the way that the rest of the family had. We went over to their house right beside the parsonage, and they led us into a bedroom, and there, and there, lying on a bed, was David, the son and brother. David had been born with spina bifida. The doctors told Eleanor and J.R., his parents, that David will be fortunate to live to be seven or eight. David, at that time, was 25. He was 25 through the grace of God and the love of that community. He was 25 through the grace of God that worked through his mother, Eleanor, who had gone to nursing school and who would tell you if she were here this morning, I went to nursing school led there by God because God knew that David was coming to us and I would need to know how to take care of him. 
Eleanor Nurse David day by day by day at home. And the family and the church and the community uh, surrounded this wonderful family with love and care. And this family gave to the entire community a witness of servant love and leadership. One morning during Advent, Mike and I went out to the car to leave, and I looked over toward our next-door neighbor's house. And there, coming out of the door, was J.R., our neighbor. J.R. is not a large man, a little taller than I am, doesn't weigh much more. And he had David in his arms. He had picked up David and was carrying him out to the car to put David in the front seat to take him for a doctor's visit. And we watched as J.R. carried David in his arms out to the car. And as he got the door open and slid his son into the front seat, his son was almost as large as he was. J.R. carried David with such tender, loving care to the car. And Mike and I stood by our car and watched it with tears rolling down both of our faces, mute before this great witness to God's way in the world. All I can do is point to that kind of witness. As Zechariah pointed, Zechariah on the tablet wrote, His name will be John, believing now the word of Gabriel. And he could speak again. And I am confident, as are you this day, that as he spoke from that time forth, he had a renewed appreciation for the way every word is a gift how every word can be artfully chosen, how every word can be a means of God's grace, inviting, beckoning, healing, and raising up. During this season of Advent, may we be appropriately silent before the coming of the Lord that our words and our lives may be used for God's holy purposes. Let us pray. Loving God, we are a people who are lovers of words well chosen. We engage text and commentaries and theological work and poetry and other expressions of the written word. At times we confess before you our tendency to be wordy. Through your servant Zechariah, however, you teach us That holy muteness is the Advent posture, and we wait quietly with great expectation for the ways that you will come anew to us in this holy season. Amen.